Hey, everybody, thank you all for being here. Um, this uh, today is um, a combination um, lesson um, on some um, journaling and visualization, visualization ideas. It's partially understanding, uh, kind of we're gonna get a deeper understanding of mountain meadow ecosystems. And um, we are going to launch on a joint project together. So this is a, a special um, event. We're delighted to have all of you here. I also want to um, thank um, Vea Moore and Melinda Nakagawa um, as uh, part of our team of co-hosts who will be uh, helping manage things behind the scenes. Um, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're first going to be hearing from Ann Chadwick, um, nature journaler um, who you've met in a lot of our um, previous um, events from, as she showed you on her cup, from Point Blue Conservation Science. And she's going to be telling you a little bit about Point Blue, which is an organization near and dear to my heart. And um, so we'll be hearing um, a little bit about what's going on there. And she's going to be introducing part of the Point Blue team. That's Ryan Burnett. And uh, Ryan's going to be uh, sharing us informate with us information about mountain meadows, and then we're going to look at um, how we can um, visual uh, how we can create a better um, graphic. Sort of the big picture of what's going on here is that I'm going to just do a little bit of a screen share with all of you for a moment, and um, what we are doing is there is a, I'm going to go to one of four, um, three, two, one, oh, uh, two of four. Um, so this, this is a, uh, an image that has been really, really useful in talking about mountain meadow ecosystems. It's what's called an infographic. So it is a visual representation, a simplified representation of a physical space that is graphically showing um, different parts of an environment. Um, as time is going on and our understanding of mountain ecosystems has gotten more mature, um, people who are doing education about mountain meadows have wanted something a little bit more nuanced um, and and uh, deeper than this. Great graphic, great illustration. Um, it's actually part of a two-part thing. Um, I am here's the other part of it. This is um, this is the sad mountain meadow. Um, mm -hmm. And when mountain meadows go um, south, you can you'll find uh, things much like you are, are 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 seeing here in this picture. So you see that this is this is showing the kind of the difference between a healthy and a or sorry here a healthy and a an unhealthy mountain meadow. There's actually some really wonderful things going on in mountain meadow restoration. And um, we'll be hearing a little bit more about that. But we need to, we want to help the mountain meadow researchers um, come up with a system for, for uh, communicating about mountain meadows that is going to be more, re, uh, more, more nuanced and useful than this. So I'm going to stop that share. And um, and now I am going to disappear, and um, we're going to hear from Ann Chadwick um, a little bit about Point Blue, and she's going to be introducing our um, our mountain meadow uh, biologist um, Ryan Burnett. So um, Ann, I am delighted that you he are here. Thank you so much for your work in conservation and stewardship of nature. Um, it's really, really important and um, mad props and respect. With that, I am disappearing. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jack. And it's great to see so many friends from my two favorite communities, nature journaling and conservation science. As I've said before, they go hand in hand and we all share those values of curiosity, deep observation and a love of nature. Many of us are turning those values into action, whether through outdoors and science education, stewardship or climate smart conservation. And I'm just so grateful to be one of many collaborators with you, Jack, as you lead us on this exciting journey. So I am vice chair of the board of Point Blue Conservation Science, which is a nonprofit 
with 160 researchers working on nature-based solutions to climate change. We like to say that our work ranges from the Sierra to the sea and from Alaska to Antarctica. And today we'll focus on the Sierra and the importance of healthy mountain meadows. And we're coming to you from California, but these observations apply to meadow ecosystems around the world. Not too long ago, I lived on Donner Summit, north of Lake Tahoe, and was chair of the Truckee Donner Land Trust. In 2012, we acquired Van Norden Meadow, about a thousand acres, as part of a bigger land deal. And it's a great example of a mountain meadow that suffered from years of human-caused degradation, and it can benefit from proper restoration. So over the years, mountain meadows, like Van Norden, have been used for grazing, sheep grazing, cattle grazing, a railroad, old Highway 40, power lines, a ski resort, and threatened housing development. And historically, up there, the average snowfall at the summit was 40 feet per year. Yeah, 480 inches, really. And the goal of many users was to get all that moisture off the meadow as quickly as possible for grazing, railroads, uh, the road, and so on. But a healthy meadow acts like a sponge and retains and filters water throughout the spring and summer and even into fall, creating an important and, bio and biodiverse ecosystem. So as the owners of this meadow, the land trust relied on scientists, including the, the great folks at Point Blue, to advise on restoration. And that's how I got to know Ryan Burnett, who's our guest speaker today. He'll talk about meadow ecosystems, and then Jack is going to lead us through this development of a new and improved infographic that we can use in our work with uh, all our collaborators all over the region. And before I forget, let me suggest to those of you who are kind of new to this format, start drawing now. Take notes, doodle, write down bits of information as they come in. You might even draw a fun picture of you know, Jack in a big floppy hat. Um, but just start warming up and it'll get you ready for the infographic and it helps you remember what we're all talking about here today. So I'm really pleased to introduce Ryan Burnett. Um, he is the director of the Sierra Nevada group and he oversees Point Blue's work on understanding the ecology and improving conservation in the Sierra Nevada ecosystem. He's uh, particularly interested in using birds as indicators to guide and evaluate land management and conservation decisions. After graduating from UC Davis with a degree in wildlife, fish, and conservation biology, he accepted an internship with Point Blue back in 1997. In those early years, he worked and played on many different islands, including San Clemente, the Farallons, San Nicolas, Midway Atoll, and St. Catharines, studying a broad range of species, including, get this, black-footed albatross, painted buntings, endangered loggerhead shrikes, and great white sharks. I mean, Ryan is our own Indiana Jones. You'll see. Uh, in the spring of 2000, he took on a small project for Point Blue in the Lassen National Forest, and he and his family have been living in Chester ever since, but the Dixie fire made them evacuate a couple weeks ago. And Ryan, we're just glad that you're all safe. Uh, his work over the past 21 years has focused on management and restoration of a broad range of important Sierra Meadow ha habitats, including riparian, oak, uh, aspens, meadows, burned forests, and a long-term study of conifer forest fuel reduction. Ryan leads the Sierra Meadows Partnership and he can tell you about their ambitious goals and progress to date. So enough from me, Ryan, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I will see you on the other side. Awesome, thanks so much, Anne, for that introduction. Um, no one's ever called me Indiana Jones, so I, I'll take <laughs> it, I'll take it. Um, thank you all for being here um, and for your interest in uh, hearing some more about uh, Sierra Meadows and Sierra Meadow conservation. It's something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, in the last 20 years working in the Sierra Nevada ecosystem up in really the headwaters of much of California's water supply. Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, some slides here and hopefully not bore you too much, um, just kind of get you some visuals to be thinking about the visuals you guys are going to help us create. It's really great to have this community kind of helping us develop more communication tools. We've, we've identified with our partnership that's trying to restore and protect 30,000 acres of Sierra Meadow over the next 10 years, the need for greater communications to broaden the community that is working on this problem. 
um, because it really does affect us all. Very small portion of California's population lives uh, within a couple miles of a meadow, of a Sierra meadow, but almost every single person who lives in California is affected by a Sierra meadow uh, because they really are the headwaters where almost all of our water supply that, that feeds us, that provides us water uh, comes from. And so they really are important places. Um, so with that, I'm gonna jump in and share some slides with you. Share my screen. So Jack or Ann, just confirm with me, you guys are seeing this. There's usually a little delay in Zoom from when I pop something up. We yeah. see it very well. Looks, Looks great. great. Awesome. Beautiful All right. Talk. Yeah, this is uh, Tasman Koyam, which is actually used to be known as Humbug Valley. It was acquired, reacquired by the Maidu Summit Consortium. Um, it's the headwaters of the North Fork of the Feather River. This is Yellow Creek, and uh, it no longer looks like that in the background. Uh, the Dixie Fire just burned through this area uh, about two weeks ago. But this is one of our important sites we've been studying for a long time where we've done meadow restoration or planning on doing a lot more. So like I was saying before, these meadows really are our headwaters. They're the headwaters from which much of California's water flows. Um, and unfortunately, they're, they're, they've been heavily impacted, as Anne just described, not many more than Van Norden and all of its impacts, but many of them have had similar impacts that really are reducing the benefits they're providing us. So why are healthy meadows so important? Water is a huge one. Water in California is our biggest, probably our biggest conservation issue um, going forward and our biggest climate issue uh, in this drought stricken state. So uh, healthy meadows improve water quality. They reduce downstream flooding uh, and they're natural reservoirs. They can hold water for a long time in the, <clears throat> uh, through the dry season and slowly release it back. So we live in a state in which water doesn't matter. The timing of water matters in California. And so we can get all the water in the world. If it all flows out uh, in March and April, it's all going out the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and, and we don't capture much of it except for in our reservoir. So having water late in the summer, like this time of year in California, is a really important thing ecologically and obviously for humans too. Healthy meadows are incredible carbon sinks. Uh, they can store an enormous amount of carbon. I'll get more into that. Uh, they are hot spots for biological diversity. Uh, California is a diverse place, uh, supports a lot of biological diversity. Uh, very few habitats support more than healthy wet meadows. They are biological hotspots in California. And we're learning more and more that they're important climate refugia. They're cool, they're wet, and they often uh, are not impacted as heavily by fire. And so those are three reasons why they really are important climate refugia um, for lots of species. So. Soil carbon has become a big deal. 25, 30 years ago, we wouldn't have been talking so much about this. The soil scientists would have been talking about this, but the rest of us ecologists and conservationists probably weren't talking too much about the importance of sequestering carbon in the soils of Sierra Meadows. But now it's become a huge uh, deal in California. Uh, and soil carbon stocks is what we're finding from a lot of studies are much higher in functioning meadows, those wet conditions. Um, the, the happy meadow that Jack just showed us uh, stores and holds a lot more soil carbon. And so that's these figures here kind of show you the, the amount of soil carbon uh, in kilograms per meter squared in a healthy, on the left, a functioning meadow, a degrading meadow, and then a fully degraded meadow. And so it's a big difference, almost double the amount of carbon gets stored. But that's not the end of the story. A recent paper by some of our colleagues in the Sierra Meadows, Sierra Meadows Partnership showed us, Cody Reed, that, uh, that healthy meadows, uh, are capable of storing as much carbon as a tropical rainforest, uh, which is just astounding, the amount of soil carbon they can put in the ground. But degraded meadows are not only not storing as much soil carbon, they're net emitters of carbon. And so they're volatilizing their carbon that they've stored up over the last 2000 years or so in these soils back into the atmosphere. So the difference when you compare the two from being a huge sequester of carbon to a net emitter, uh, makes a big difference, and so uh, to you know to carbon markets in California, um, and so we are spending a lot of money in California right now, uh, paying to restore meadows uh, as a carbon offset in the state of California. 
So something near and dear to my heart is the biological diversity in meadows. And so I hope the stuff you guys draw today has lots of biodiversity because it's hard to understate the, the biodiversity benefits of uh, Sierra Meadows. So they're really important habitat for birds, fish, uh, amphibians, pollinators, our native bees, butterflies, uh, all sorts of, you know, but the biodiversity lives in the insect world, right? And, and uh, they're important deer fawning grounds for a lot of migratory deer herds in the state of California. And not only are they supporting rich biodiversity, they're really the majority of our special status species in the Sierra Nevada are meadow associated wildlife. So something here like on this side, willow flycatcher there, we're down to about 200 breeding pairs of willow flycatcher in the whole Sierra Nevada, uh, which is a very small population. Golden trout in the Southern Sierra are dependent on the, the flows that come out of our wet meadows. Uh, Yellow-legged frogs that are, are now getting listed as endangered, our Cascades frog, which are just about to be listed as endangered, all meadow-dependent amphibians, things like long-toed salamanders, um, species of concern. Uh, our western bumblebees um, are also a species of concern now, are a meadow-associated uh, species. So lots of endangered, threatened species occur in Sierra Meadow, something like our greater sandhill cranes, uh, uh, totally uh, meadow dependent species. And they really are, and I emphasize this because it's my specialty is birds, they are a keystone habitat for Sierra birds for several reasons. Um, so the, they're, they support a high diversity of breeding birds, including some of our endangered threatened species like sandhill crane and will flycatcher. Um, but they're also used by the majority of species that breed in the Sierra Nevada during some point in their annual cycle. So think about the complex life cycle we have for all these birds who maybe winter in Central America, migrate up to the Sierra, breed for a couple months, then migrate, store up a bunch of fat and migrate back down. And so during some point in the year, especially in late summer, this time right now, a lot of the species as the forests dry up and uh, the resources of them become scarcer. A lot of our upland species end up in meadows and they use them as molting grounds. And we actually find that the majority of young birds that are produced in, in the Sierra Nevada end up in Sierra Meadows during, during this time of year. And so I think of them kind of as an estuary for birds. And so it's this place that the young birds go, inexperienced birds go, where there's lots of resources available. There's lots of cover to hide from predators when you're not uh, you know, you, you get six weeks with your parents and then you're kicked out and you're on your own, you got to figure it out. And meadows can be a pretty soft landing space for a lot of birds. Um, so we find the majority of birds that are in meadows in late summer are molting and putting on fat for migration. Um, and that's really because they're chasing spring. So up in our high elevation meadows, they stay wet and productive late into the summers. And so there's still lots of insects around, there's lots of water around. And so they really play this important role in kind of buffering drought conditions in the Sierra. And what we found, this, this uh, figure on the bottom here shows you that in dry years, we go up into meadows, we put up nets and we capture birds for the last 20 years, although we didn't get to do it this year because we got out of there by a fire. But in dry years, we capture uh, almost three times more birds in these meadows in late summer. And we think it's both the case that actually during drier years, there's more productivity in the avian community in the Sierras, but it's also drier and drives them more into meadows. And so if we can produce more birds in dry years, having these healthy meadows there to buffer these effects so these birds have resources available so they can migrate successfully really makes these meadows important. And that's why I think they really are a keystone habitat for birds. So this is the bummer of the talk. Uh, meadow, great, we've estimated that greater than 50% of the Sierra Meadows are degraded. They're in a state that makes them less productive and less capable of providing all these resources, whether it be water to us, uh, clean water that's not full of silt, that doesn't silt up our uh, clean power generation facilities. Um, all these things that meadows are important for, carbon sink, et cetera, are being threatened by this degradation, This this degradation that's uh, rampant across our Sierra Meadows. And so here's some examples of some degraded systems. And oftentimes what it is, is channel incision. So you can see the stream channel, and this goes kind of to the graphic Jack was showing, especially that picture on the bottom left there. That's actually that picture, my very first picture I showed you with the, the meadow pinstemon blooming with the nice water and everything green on the front cover slide. That is just upstream of the picture on your bottom left. That's the exact same stream. This is still grazed and not, we haven't restored it yet. 
and the other side has had grazing removed and has been restored. So huge changes can be made in these meadows by restoring them. And so that's really the positive of all this. Um, so just to kind of give you some ideas about things you might be working on, here's a degraded meadow. And so what we see in here is eroding stream banks. So you can see them sloughing off there, those, those chunks of vegetation on the far bank there. Um, the channel is incised, which incision basically in stream channel means it's widened and deepened so that basically the carrying capacity, the volume of water the channel can hold is far greater than what it should be able to hold. All the energy gets trapped in the bottom of that channel when you get a high flow event instead of spreading out across the floodplain. And so that dries up your floodplain because now you basically have a big French drain down the middle of your meadow. Um, and so when you dry out your floodplain, you volatilize soil carbon. So we always say this, those things stopping oxygen from getting in the soil, too much oxygen from getting in the soil is water and moisture. You take that out, now oxygen gets in your soil. And I tell all the kids, if you've got a lot of C in your soil and you add O2 to it, what do you get? You get a lot of CO2 and you volatilize it right to the atmosphere. Um, and so you also dry out your floodplain and you convert it into upland habitat. So in this picture, there's some lovely sagebrush. I always tell people there's like 40 million acres of sagebrush just east of the Sierra Nevada. We don't need to also grow and manage sagebrush in our meadows. Uh, and so we've converted a lot of our meadow floodplains that should be full of herbaceous vegetation and willows and a lot of these incredible flowering plants like tiger li leopard lilies and columbine and monk's hood and things like that. And we've converted it into sagebrush flats. They're full of things like this brewer sparrow, which is a fine bird on its own, but it has Again, 40 million acres just to the east of here, that's all it's. Uh, we want this habitat for willow flycatchers and sandhill cranes and uh, cascades frogs and things like that. So, oh, I forgot one water. And the other thing about these, these highly incised channels is the water gets conveyed downstream very quickly. Uh, and so when we get these big uh, rain on snow events, uh, water all of a sudden rushes down these channels really quickly. And why that matters is, for those of you who know Northern California or, or uh, watched the news a few years back, if you remember in 2017, we had these huge flood events in California and Oroville Dam, the largest earthen dam in the United States, topped itself and they had to evacuate a couple hundred thousand people because they thought the dam was gonna blow. And if they just had like two more days to drain that water, two more days of advance notice, it would have made a huge difference for them. And so. So attenuating flood flows is a really important function that, that these meadows play. And as we dry out the Sierra Nevada and, uh, and turn, uh, we uh, warm up the Sierra Nevada and more of our precipitation comes as rain instead of snow, slowing down the floodwaters coming downstream is gonna be an important thing. So here, this is downstream on the same meadow I was just showing you where we've done restoration. We fenced the riparian area, kept, so the cows only have access when we want them to have access. You know, we are now growing a dense and tall sedge understory. Um, you can see in the foreground all that lush vegetation. We're getting a lot of willow regeneration. We have some mature willows in the background that are pretty in dense thickets. Um, our water table is near the surface and stays there through the summer. Um, and the stream channel is much, much smaller. And therefore, whenever the flows increase with spring snowmelt, they can quickly access the floodplain. So it dissipates energy out of our channel, deposits sediment, on the floodplain surface. That's really kind of the key function these meadows play is floodplain inundation flood flows. They are floodplains and they need those sediment deposition and all, those, all that, uh, that kind of flows from these floodwaters accessing the floodplain, rehydrating the sponge that is this meadow. Um, so it's pretty amazing. This is taken to basically the same time of year as that picture you just saw, which was a sagebrush flat dried out. This is downstream after we did restoration. All right. Um, oh, I put that in there twice. Um, so what can we do in, in these meadows? We can restore degraded meadows. We can protect meadows for, from conversion. So a lot of our meadows, um, so like Ann was mentioning, you know, housing developments in Van Norden have been a threat. In the steep uh, terrain of the Sierra Nevada, we like to inhabit and ha humans have for a very long time, the valley bottoms. And unfortunately, those are where our meadows occur. And so we have converted those to reservoirs, golf courses, housing developments. And so we need to do, this isn't just about restoring these meadows, it's about protecting them from being degraded and converted to something else. Um, and so the land trust community plays an important role in our partnership to uh, protect Sierra Meadows. And, and indeed, 
the work that Anne and her land trust did to protect uh, Van Norden Meadow catalyzed then a big restoration project. So they often go hand in hand. Uh, and we can do a lot better job uh, managing how we manage the existing meadow resources that are in decent shape or after we restore them. And restoration, as I've shown you here in a couple of pictures, can be a game changer. Here's that image again on the left of the degraded incised meadow, dried out, bare ground. Uh, and on the left, upstream where we've done restoration, the vegetation's two or three feet tall. It's a very wet vegetation because it's the water's near the surface. There's big lines of willow. And this indeed, that picture right there is right in the smack middle of a willow flycatcher territory. So Point Blue is doing a lot of other work besides uh, leading this partnership, we are helping prioritize where to focus resources. If you have 250,000 acres of meadows and you think 125,000 acres of them are, are degraded, you need to prioritize where to do that work because we're not going to be able to restore them all in the time we need to restore them in the next. Uh, we're trying to restore 30, you know, around 30,000 acres of the 125 that need it. So we have built tools to help prioritize where all these resources might be best achieved uh, that healthy meadows support. Um, we are working with teams to innovate new solutions. So you may have heard of the idea of using beavers are really, we've discovered beavers to be a really important part of our Sierra Meadows. Um, they are ecosystem engineers. Uh, and so we've decided not only to work with beavers, we've decided to imitate beavers. So uh, imitation is the you know, nicest form of flattery, right? So we are building on the left there and the right, we are building our own version of beaver dams. I can tell you right now, they do it better than us. <laughs> they work 24 seven. <laughs> Um, but we are hoping to attract beavers to these areas to then maintain the water table at the surface uh, in these meadows. Um, and we are testing how that's working in a place called Child's Meadow, which is actually on fire today. Um, we are teaching climate smart restoration uh, principles uh, to restoration practitioners and land uh, conservation groups, uh, just how to incorporate climate change and look through a climate lens on everything we do. And we are engaging communities. We have a program at Point Blue, um, one that Anne really loves called STRAW, uh, which is students and teachers restoring a watershed. We've been doing this in the barrier for 25 years. In the last four years, we've expanded it to the Sierra. And so we are out uh, with the local communities because we cannot steward these lands forever by ourselves. We have to do it as communities. And so teaching these next kids, these, this next generation to be stewards of these lands, to care about these lands is gonna be just as important as doing this work in conservation today. Uh, and finally, the, the Sierra Meadows Partnership, and I mentioned this already, uh, we are restoring and protecting 30,000 acres by 2030 to enhance water, carbon and biodiversity benefits. Uh, this is a, a group of, of government, non-government, uh, universities and others, basically everyone working in Sierra Meadows conservation across uh, the range, uh, working to achieve this goal. And I can tell you that we just did a summary this last year and we protected or restored uh, almost 10,000 acres so far. And we have another 15,000 acres in the works that are, 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 we think are, will be restored or protected in the next five years. So we think we're well on pace to meet that target. We might indeed exceed that target. My goal is to exceed that target because the need is greater. All right, and I showed you that one already, but I'll just leave you again with a, a last idea of, a, of, of what a, one idea of a healthy meadow looks like. Jack, you're still muted. There you go. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, Ryan, this is uh, this is really interesting and really important work. So um, again, we are, hold on, I'm gonna add myself in here as a little spotlight, hi. So um, so we're talking about, these are our, 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 our kind of isolated little ecosystems, ecologically really, really important, also in, have um, all sorts of benefits to us as human beings in our water quality and carbon sequestration. Um, as far as their role in um, in uh, their ecological role, Ryan was talking about them being um, sort of these these sort of keystone um, uh, habitats. And sort of the idea of a keystone, of course, is if you have an arch, that one at the top that's sort of wedge shaped, is the piece that holds everything together. Once we figured out how to make keystones, we were able to make um, arched doorways. So. A, the idea of that in sort of ecosystem terms is that these are systems that have 
a huge impact on the structure of all sorts of other sort of related systems in the Sierra environment. So a lot of the birds, again, we're seeing the birds using these as kind of nursery areas, um, a, a safe place, a, a clean, well-lighted place um, for, for growing up, um, uh, deer and other critters using these. So these are essential ecosystems. Um, what we want to do as a group is to create graphics that Point Blue and other stream ecologists can use to communicate this. Now, you, the Nature Journal Club, you are our masters of visual communication. And what we're gonna do is we are going to crowdsource community education on how to make this work. So I am going to, um, Ryan, thank you so much for that overview. Um, I am going to just bounce back to, let's take a look at the graphic that we, we, that we currently have. It's good, but we can do better. And um, it's going to also be fun to collectively do this together. So um, here it is. And I make it big, big, big. All right. So um, what is this showing? So take a look at this, and I want everybody to add into the chat what concepts this shows, what concepts this shows, all right? What ideas are they showing with this graphic? And Jack, I think if you push the little plus button down on the lower right, it might expand that even more in your in oh, screen. There it you does. go. Uh, boom. <laughs> Okay. All right. Add in the chat. What is going on here? Yeah, we're seeing a lot about water filtration, water flow, multiple oh. habitats, percolation. Yep. Yep. So we topography. Great. Yeah, lush foliage. All right. So yeah, we've got a high water table here. Um, we see the water soaking in, like think of this mountain meadow, like a giant sponge holding on to the water. Um, all that vegetation near the sides, the fact that it is winding back and forth, that we see it winding back there is really important. So it is, it's a, a, a shallow stream that winds back and forth across this broad floodplain. There's dense vegetation around the edges of it. It's and it is, it's close to the, the, the surface, All right? Um, now let's think about what of the major ideas that Ryan shared does this not show? What does this not show? The critters, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of blotches back there that may be critters, but really mm -hmm. unclear. Yep, the carbon idea. Right? Yeah, the carbon sequestration, that's a big deal. All right. Um, so the idea of the biodiversity here, um, how it's being used by the animals. Um, so let's see here, what else? Oh uh, yeah, we don't have no beaver out there, and, and yeah. So and sort of, you know, also we're thinking about kind of timing of things. Um, you know, the idea that it's going to flood during um, big water events. It's going to jump out of this stream, um, and then uh, the rest of the time slowly re release this. The idea that it is um, holding uh, that the, the the stream is clear instead of filled with silt. Excellent, excellent. Now, um, nope. now uh, let's take a look at um, so this 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 file that I'm looking at, by the way, this is um, if you look at the start of the chat, we'll also put this in the um, episode notes. Um, the, at the start of our chat, there is a link to this Dropbox file. 
where all of you can find this. So there's also an article here on why mountain meadows are important. Um, and, and Jack, I just added the link once again in the chat. So oh, terrific. It's right up there. Yeah. Um, so here we have the uh, after version. All right, I see some sagebrush there. All right, think about what this effectively communicates. What do you notice here that's done on purpose in this infographic? Oh, interesting. Some person mentioning that the, the, the uh, that would be also nice for these to show people and um, us both in the act of stewardship and uh, reaping the benefits of it. Um, sage encroachment, cows are out there. Um, the water table is so low here. Yep, really low water table. Um, it shows how deep this is cut down and also wide. Yep. All right, so useful. And also look at how straight that is. Now it's just kind of coming through. We don't quite have a sense of the speed of the water though, but we'd imagine that that water would be going through quickly. Um, are there things here that this is not showing? Things that this is not showing? What else would we want in there? Ah, ah, so something about the carbon. We want to sort of, this is where we want to kind of get information about um, something about the, the carbon cycling. So it's carbon going from being bound up in organic material to volatilizing into the air. Um, so carbon stored in plants and um, partially uh, and, 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 and in, in the soil to back to carbon dioxide mixed with oxygen in the air. Right? And the idea that, that in this, we would have a lower diversity of other animals in there. The water here also looks clear that we could make that water more muddied. Um, all right. So this is, this is, is, is what we've got to, to, to work with. I'm going to stop this share for a moment. So what we're thinking about is this may end up being two separate graphics. It may end up being one graphic. Um, for our purposes now, let's think about this as two graphics, right? The pristine one and the degraded system. And for, and we want to think of how we're going to visually communicate these sorts of things. We can use a bunch of ideas from those ones which we just saw, and we're going to make it better. And visually, imagine a number of things, a, a, a poster where it's clear that this is a kind of a collage of different elements from different people, um, all communicating this, but we are going to then get together and do some kind of graphic design to pull it all together so it feels like one thing, but it's going to intentionally feel like, um, uh, it, like it is the result of all of our work together. Um, the, Part of this is going to be spot illustrations. So the idea of a spot illustration, let me um, just jump over to a share video here. All right. Here is a, a piece of paper. Um, let's say I've got a, a, a willow flycatcher and um, my little willow flycatcher is, um, out there, like little fly, willow flycatcher um, on a nest is, is one thing. If that willow flycatcher is next to its, its, its nest, um, and you see that with some foliage around, see what I've done is I've just taken this little thing that says willow flycatcher, and I'm now telling a more, more of a story. Willow flycatcher with some vegetation in the background, they are nesting here. And might even have some little, you know, feed me, feed me, feed me, baby sticking up here. All right. Um, so as we're thinking about, so this would be then a spot illustration. And what you do is you would, um, we need some just drawings of, of these sorts of things that are graphic, that are clear, and um, sort of uh, bold colors help. What we're going to do then is, um, 
myself and other people on the team are going to sort of take these images. We will cut them out and we'll either then place them on a sort of perhaps a colored circle. You don't have to worry about the sort of the, like what we're doing with the sort of background shape. So just let, let your drawing be as much, as much as it is. You don't have to worry about kind of cropping it in any way. Uh, we'll do that. And so we may have, you know, those as little kind of call out boxes saying like, look, here's this willow flycatcher. And that box is then going to be pointing down to another thing here. Um, over here is a little picture of, of, the, of, of the cute little fawn, right? And it's all kind of nestled down in the grass and there's mama deer standing behind it. Um, and, um, and, you know, that will be, you know, perhaps we're using square boxes, I don't know yet. Um, so we can have these as little kind of insets that are going to help us sort of flesh things out. That's sort of what's the idea of a spot illustration. These little illustrations, we're going to be moving those around on top of, or to, to kind of pull out the details of um, major um, elements. Those then are going to be set in on a larger drawing that is showing what's going on with these habitats. Um, when you think about this, these drawings are also going to be not shown at their full size. So on our spot illustrations, if I get in here and I am like all this really fine detail around the eye of my willow flycatcher, um, when this gets turned into a drawing that ends up being this big on 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 a uh, on the final product a lot of the little detail gets lost so this is a big illustrator trick is to realize that the drawings the spot illustrations that you're making are going to be reduced and coming in at a smaller size. So that means think about your bigger lines. What are the big lines that you really want to be prominent and make those a little bit more prominent and bold than you normally would. That can kind of give things a graphic sense. So you still want to, you know, the fact that like, you know, here's its eye ring and you know, but realize that a lot of your final detail, if it's really micro detail and texture, that will be lost. So a good way of testing this is to walk away from your picture and look at it from across the room and to give you a sense of how well these little drawings are going to reduce. Does it still read well when made smaller? That's a very useful trick for making a little spot illustration. In addition to these, um, we are also, we want to think about making sketches of some of the ideas that Ryan's been talking about. So part of it is we need some uh, uh, diagrams and pictures of, of um, of, of critters, but we also need some ideas of, um, you know, like, you know, you know, here perhaps, like, let, let's think about um, volatilization of, 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 of carbon. And so I haven't thought too much about this because I'm just hearing this talk at the first time, but I'm imagining, like, you know, one way of doing this could be a block of soil and down here in the soil, and maybe it's, it's darker on top and getting lighter down side. So you kind of get the sense that there's this rich top soil. And that has all of these little circles with C's in it. So as a little symbol for carbon. And then I am showing that this is going to change. So thinking about how to use arrows, um, 
and and other sort of uh, to, to kind of move your story along to kind of tell your idea. Um, maybe here is my second block. And again, this is the, just the idea that is coming with me, to me just right off the top of my head. What if the soil in here is a little bit lighter? There's only a few of these little carbon circles here instead of a lot of them all stored in here. And what is floating off here? Maybe there are lines sort of pointing up with you know, some sort of arrow um, with sort of a little shimmer line coming out like this. And what if there is carbon dioxide? So here are my little, maybe these are, yeah, yeah, here's, maybe I've got carbon dioxide molecules floating off here. Um, and so you see what I'm doing is I'm trying to take, I've got an idea. I've got an idea that there are, there is carbon here in the soil. Jack, can you push your paper up just a little bit? Uh, yeah. Thanks. And I'm losing that back into the atmosphere. Um, there's probably a better way to think about this. But you see the idea here? So here's a concept. And I'm going to try to, you know, how would I visualize the idea of carbon leaving the soil into the atmosphere? The idea of being a kind of a carbon sink. Maybe there are even, um, maybe there are even some plants here. And I've got some carbon dioxide molecules out here. And um, and what I'm showing, maybe this is too much information. I don't know yet, but interesting to throw out that that then is the carbon is getting locked into the plants and it's letting out the oxygen. I don't know. Um, but you see what, what I'm doing here is thinking about how can I communicate ideas visually? And that's what infographics are. I want people to think about like, oh, this soil stores a lot of carbon, right? And it's, we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere. So this is a carbon sink, right? So carbon is coming in here with all of these lovely green plants. But over here, we're, we're losing that carbon out, right? How would I show an idea of, um, of this idea of the ground being a sponge and holding water? How would I visualize the idea of how the um, how um, how how this is a nursery for birds, right? And all the things that the the the, the birds need. Um, how could I visualize the idea of that this meadow is holding on to water and letting it out slowly instead of letting the water go right through? Can I make a visual that without having to have like too much of a title, like the little red circles meaning carbon and blah, 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 where somebody could look at this and kind of go like, oh, I get it. I see what you're doing. That's our goal. That's our, that's our goal, All right? Um, so we want to start thinking about those. And by the way, what's going to happen in this is we're going to end up with more graphics than we can use if this goes well, right? But a bunch of those other graphics can also be used in presentations. So you can imagine a scientist, part of what's going on is that the scientists need to communicate these ideas to the community, right? So what if 
that scientist who's up there in front of, you know, at a city council meeting doing their presentation, instead of that diagram with the black dots and the bars on it, talking about kind of carbon sequestration, right? What if there was a graphic, an infographic that was made by somebody who, um, by, by, by one of us to take that idea and make it clear. We are con contributing to conservation through communication. By making these ideas accessible, right? So part of these, some of these are gonna go directly into this poster and others, we can also have them then available to these scientists when they're doing presentations and, and things. So even if, so if several of us do a carbon sink diagram, that's not wasted effort. Um, so let's, um, let me also kind of jump over to kind of the big, so these little, you know, insets, these inset pieces are set on top of something that I like, that I liked about the old ones is that big kind of three-dimensional view of the valley with a cutaway where you could kind of see into the ground. And I liked how they kind of did the kind of getting down to bedrock there. There's some neat sorts of, of, of things that were, were in there. But let's take a look at how we might kind of go about diet, making a block diagram to visualize the healthy versus unhealthy system. And so before this class, I was sitting down and I was playing with this. And I want to kind of just walk you through, um, I went through kind of when you're thinking about these, expect to go through a bunch of kind of scrappy versions of things that are kind of scribbly and, and just like, you know, like, uh, not that, like, uh, not that. so a lot of your thinking can be these when you're kind of trying to come up with a visual image for something, you're going to initially go through a bunch of little diagrams that um, are gonna get you progressively closer to being able to visualize. Don't expect us to sit down and kind of go like, ah, here it is, right? But I'll show you kind of where I am right now. Like this was like the most recent thing that I came up with, but I think that y'all, can do even better than this. I wanted to have mountains in the background. I wanted there to be a meadow in front that gets closer to you so you can see the, the cutaway version of it. I wanted to be able to see cross section of soil. Um, I wanted to have a forested edge around there and there's my little water table. So here is um, kind of how I went about doing this. So I'm just gonna do kind of a, a real quick, a real quickie on how we, do a little block diagram. Um, here we go. All right, so um, what I did is I started with just a kind of perspective view of, I want to have, I want to have at least a meadow area that is, whoops. I, for some reason, my, can, um, can folks see my screen? Um, yes, I, we can, we can see your drawing. You can see the drawing, okay, great. All right, so what I want to do is I want to have this sort of recede into the distance here. So this is gonna be like my big edge and sort of like this corner of it is closer to you. And then what I, 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 I thought initially about, then this is gonna back up on, uh, essentially there's gonna be mountains around the sides of this. So to put those mountains in, here's how I initially blocked that in. I just added a little um, extra block like this around the sides. Whoops, I gotta come down. Hey, check that out, I caught myself doing it that time. Um, so 
So I've got this sort of rough kind of couch that I've made, right? <laughs> so here's, here's my, 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 my couch for my meadow. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn this back um, wall of the couch into a, a little mountain. So I'm gonna actually just sort of say that I've got a mountain that is sticking kind of up here. And as you kind of come down along the sides, that's going to, so here's the kind of edge of my mountain coming down here. And um, if there are kind of, you know, hills in this, I'm making these, sort of imagining these as being hills that are kind of overlapping like that. So that there's a little stream that comes down here. Like the streams will be coming down between these things, right? So here's a little kind of dip in this, and the stream might be coming out somewhere in there. So I get to make up this landscape. And then I'm going to do the same sort of thing over here. Um, there is, I'm going to keep this higher. And I'm bringing this line to the back edge here of this couch. So not to this front edge, back edge of the couch. And then, The front of this is going to come down somewhere in here. The front edge of this is going to be somewhere in here. So I'm just sort of visualizing. Can you slide your page over a little bit? Oh, thank you. Um, just sort of imagining that, you know, that there's, you know, roughly my mountains are kind of doing something along this. I don't actually have to, I'm not going to worry too much about this little margin in here because I get to hide it with trees. Right? So I want to have some sort of a mountainy thing back there. Um, by the way, this is just kind of what I came up with. This doesn't mean that this is right, but I want to sort of help you kind of visualize how I sort of started with this. We all start playing with this. We're going to be able to come up with something that's better. Now, um, I have, I want a stream out here that is zigzagging, right? And my zigzags are going to be smaller towards the back, and they're going to get bigger towards the front. And then as they kind of come in here towards the front, we're seeing more of this wider stream and it's gonna come over here. All right, so the stream is curving in this way. And here's kind of a cool thing. If I have a stream that is curving this way, on this side here, the water comes around faster and it makes a steep cliff edge. And on this side, it comes around slower and it makes what's called a depositional bar. So there's a shallow end. So this stream inside you would be shaped like that. The fact that the stream hooks this way means that this is gonna be the steep side and that's gonna be the shallow side. A little bit of kind of hydrology fun there, but that's gonna show up in this drawing here because here I'm showing the cross section of this. And this side is going to be more of a shallow side. And this side coming in here is going to, I'm going to have a steep bank that is going to come up underneath the water. Now, um, in here, I can put some fish in my stream. I want a water table that is fairly close to the surface. In this part, I'm going to be able to see into the water. I like how they show um, in that there's that, that there's water also kind of going all the way back in here, and maybe there's some bedrock down here. Nice job on the bedrock that they did in that uh, that other drawing. I might steal some of their ideas, but now I'm going to put in willow thickets. So back here. I want people to still see that this is a, a meandering stream with a little other stream kind of coming into it. Um, but I can put in, so that it doesn't kind of obscure the picture, most of my willow thicket back here will be on the other side of the stream. But I might put a few willows on this side, but not so much that I kind of block this. 
Maybe there's even room for a beaver dam here. And I'm gonna put in a big pool. Put in a big pool there. Oh, that would be fun. I just added a beaver dam. Oh. And then a little inset drawing here of the beaver. I don't know, that could be cool. Um, then um, perhaps I want, you know, uh, another willow here, a bigger willow on this side of my stream. You know, it's not kind of bug. People can kind of still see what's going on here. Then I'm putting kind of close vegetation. So um, I then I'm going to show dark soil. I want that nice, rich, dark soil kind of coming down. Um, and for the, the, the intermediate area here, what I did over here, which seemed to work really well, is just you know, covered that with trees. So that meant that I'm going to switch pens so that we, uh, with a slightly thicker pen, um, these next lines will be a little bit easier to see. But look at this. Because this is closer to me here, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to actually draw in some of these as bigger trees in here. So right there, I'm going to draw you some bigger trees. And then as it goes back here, there's a quick that kind of, kind of gets smaller. And till back around here, I'm just kind of suggesting that there's a forest edge. And so maybe it's a few of trees over here. Because on this edge that's closer to me, those trees, I'm going to be kind of looking into the edge of the forest. So I've got some bigger trees in here. And then so you see what I'm doing is I am. One other line I want on the edge of this mountain here. The tree's going up that. I'm going to try to get as many of those ideas as I can into it. So where, where am I going to have my little deer out here? Um, with its little fawn, there'd then be an inset pointing to that. In here, um, I'm going to have, you know, a, 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 an inset going to the willow flycatcher. Um, maybe here, um, maybe I have, here's, here's a thought. What if kind of coming down the stream here, there is an arrow that is you know, sort of try to make a three-dimensional arrow, kind of a sort of big, slow arrow like this. And what if in the, the, the other one, I had an arrow in the stream that looks like this, you know, where it's a big, sort of fast arrow, hmm. right? I wonder if like that could be coming down the stream, like, whoa, get out of the way of that. And this thing, I'm not really worried about getting out of this way. Something that you can do with this though, is because we are kind of collaging this together, you can draw this arrow separately and take a picture of it as a separate file. And then what we, and this to have in your notes, like, you know, here is, um, you know, in, in, in the, the, the notes that you could sort of send in with this, you could say, you know, here, there's this arrow that you can add in on top, you know, in the water there to show that this water is kind of flowing this direction slowly. Um, so you may, if you wish to, add some of these as sort of separate elements. We can collage all those things together. Imagine that you're giving a lecture, you were Ryan and you were talking about this mountain meadow. And um, as you said, and the stream flow is slow. And as you said that, you could then even click a button and then that little arrow could appear there. We're gonna be able to do all of those sorts of things with your work. 
and um, the we want we we want um, a variety of styles. We want um, and and that will make this um, that variety of styles will make this visually more interesting. Just do remember these things will be reduced, especially if you are creating for us one of these sort of uh, a, a larger sort of scene of the place that will actually probably be expanded. So give us, if you are doing one of the kind of the valley that we'll be putting all this stuff on, um, please send that as a very high resolution um, file. Try to make that scan the best that you can um, because that will then be the base map that everything else is going to be layered on top of. Um, so Ryan, as you are looking at this description, um, did any quick thoughts and ideas come to you about like, like, oh, and like the duck, put in the duck. Like, are there any sort of other kind of sorts of elements here that you're, that you're thinking of like, and like, if you, you know, show, I want an undercut bank. Um, or, or what, whatever it is, I'm going to bring you back on because you know these mountain meadows. Um, are there other sort of elements in the stream in the picture that you think would be dynamite to have and be able to visualize and show? Yeah, I think you caught a lot of them. You know, I, someone posted in there this idea of if, if we could potentially make this thing uh, digital, there might be the opportunity to like to go across the scene and the bubble, you know, pops out and you see that image, it's larger and you even have facts with it or something like that. So I like some of those ideas. So I think- And, and it, we will have that capacity, yes. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, you know, I th it's it's hard to do. I, I, I like the idea of somehow these are not these pristine places that are off limits to people. Um, they are they are part of, of the, we are part of this community of the Sierra community in the meadows. So I love the idea of humans showing the link to us, I think is a big one, whether it be showing the larger context in which these meadows occur. They're not just somewhere you take a picture of and hang it on your wall when you go home. They are like every day working hard for you. I think I love those ideas. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's hard to catch that. You started to do it with the water, but the dynamism of places like this, they're not static landscapes. They do change over time. And so how we, those are hard for me. I am not, you guys are amazing with what you do. You know, I have a the science brain that doesn't visualize things like this. Um, on yes. Paper like you guys yes. do. Yeah, but, but Brian, yeah. I got to tell you, if you start journaling, if you start um, just to start doing visual note taking, it is out. It is absolutely a learnable skill. Yeah. And we, when we kind of look at people who've been doing it for a while, it's, it feels like it's 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 like this magic thing. But it is absolutely something that you can can learn and develop if you start doing it on a regular basis too. Yeah, good point. You're a good point. I, I used to a lot uh, when I was younger, and I did. It uses a different part of your brain, which is really exciting to use. Um, so just excited to have you guys tackle this and be part of the community that is working to conserve and protect Sierra Meadows. It's just exciting. I, I, it's just so important to me that doing this work is not something I do in a laboratory. It's something we do as community to conserve our important landscapes um, in the world. And so just, I'm excited to see what you guys come up with new ideas and just stuff that we can really actually use to convey the message and advance the cause to protect and, and conserve these meadows. It's really exciting to, to have you guys working on all this. So thank you. Ah, uh, yes. Um, and well, we are honored to be part of, of Team Point Blue here, um, Team Mountain Meadow, uh, putting this together. So this is, uh, again, folks, we're going to be drawing pictures. The drawings that you do are going to help communicate these critical principles to other people. So these drawings that you're doing and these diagrams and these visualizations, this is a collective conservation project. You are helping mountain meadow conservation directly by doing this because you're going to create the visuals. Um, so just a, a, a few things that all kind of the, the graphic designer in me is really excited about. I love color, right? I love me some color. This is gonna be a big color image. Let's get some color going on on this bad boy and let's play with that, All right? Um, kind of clear lines that can be reduced is really, really helpful. Um, 
And um, so, so look at your stuff from a distance away. And again, play with, Ryan talked about several ideas. We want to kind of brainstorm, how can I visualize that to like, if I were to put this graphic up on the screen and instead of somebody saying, you know, carbon sequestration and volatilizing um, uh, the uh, um, or organics, you know, from the, 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 the meadow and everybody's eyes are glazing over, they're looking at your picture. They're going like, ah, I understand more now. You've just made it, you've made it accessible. Now, Anne, I'm bringing you on. Um, what is our protocol? What is our protocol for, I've got my thing, I want to share it with this project, right? Um, and and so, so timeline on this, we have one month to create these visuals. Let's give ourselves one month to create the best visuals that we can on this. And so that's one month from today, okay? Um, and as you get these, we've, we're going to be, there's a, going to be a way to submit them online. And um, uh, Anne's gonna help us think about that. Yes, and I'm so excited because in the chat, we've got some great ideas like Ryan Peterson is saying, if you're interested in matching some of these diagrams and visuals with a virtual field trip, reach out. So we will take you up on that one. <laughs> and uh, Beth is talking about using Pro Procreate for layers that would show the di di dynamism. I can speak. Yes, yes. So, so this, this can be any media, like if you're a digital media person, Procreate, awesome. If you're a watercolor person, awesome. If you're a gouache, great, right? Okay. But let's, yes. Yeah. And a, a, a lot of people are asking if this will be recorded. And yes, it is being recorded. It'll be on Jack's website and we'll put it on the Point Blue website as well with a, a link to the video. And so in that Dropbox folder, which Lishka just uh, re, re, re um, submitted the link, there is an information piece. It's a doc, it's a doc right? A word file. Um, and so we're going to use, it tells you how we're gonna do this, Mountain Meadows infographic. We're gonna use WeTransfer to crowdsource your images for possible inclusion in this new infographic. So you will create your color graphic of a species of interest listed below or of a phenomenon that Ryan talked about and Jack talked about. Or, or the maybe, base images. Or that base image, the, the big couch. Um, <laughs> And then scan it at 350 DPI or take a high quality photo of your graphic and then go to HTTPS, and this is all in that file, to wetransfer.com and add your graphic file. And then it shows you how to email info at pointblue.org that will notify us that you've submitted your file. And we will collect them and then we'll have a team to kind of pull together what's going to be most useful in this. And it's not going to be the prettiest picture. It's not going to be the most, you know, professional botanical drawing or any of that. It's Although in some cases it, it may be, but some, may be. That, that, that's right. So yeah, we're, yeah, that's right. We're interested in useful and dynamic yeah. and, and engaging yeah. and people that get people to sit up. And also for some of these, sometimes there'll be several images of say carbon sequestration that work and those will also can have will have other lives in presentations by other researchers and and scientists sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no that's great and um so we'll we'll create this team to pull it all together and we will use it widely but so this this file this doc file has species of interest so it has the willow flycatcher sandhill crane various warblers frogs toads garter snake beaver black bear and so on and also a lot of um of plants meadow penstemon like ryan showed in that first slide um camas lily leopard lily corn lily monk's hood sedges and willows um, and then some ideas for source materials. And if you do use a photograph as your source material, please give credit where credit's due. Yeah. And, uh, actually, uh, could I add something on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, the basic idea with using photographs for reference from other people, 
this is this is a, a big deal, and I meant to talk about this, but I just got so carried away drawing my couch that I forgot. Um, so the um, I don't want to use somebody else's artwork without their permission. And photographers are artists, and um, if I can get their permission, that's great. So for instance, if you're doing bird stuff, everything on Bird Pixel and seeingbirds.com, those websites, the photographers who developed those, they um, have given us permission to use those as, as resources. But if I find just somebody else's photograph on the web, what I, I want to do is I can, um, I want it to modify it to the point where they're not gonna go like, hey, that's mine. So what you can sometimes do is take this bird's head and put it on this bird's body. So the bird changes, like you see this one, like, you know, where the head is doing this, you say, that's a cool head. Then you can stick that onto this bird's body. So you can often creatively kind of move these things around so that they're not gonna look at it and kind of go like, that is so totally my bird, right? Feather by feather. And you just copied it there. And I feel bad about it. Some people feel honored um, and they're cool with it. Most people, if you ask them, will say, oh, absolutely, I'm honored. That's great. Um, most people will be feel upset if they discover it on their own and they feel that somebody tried to pull a fast one on them. And so we, but we want to be respectful of all the other artists. So modify and, um, and then you can, can, can use. Um, or get permission from people. So we got a question from Rachel. Um, what if many people choose to illustrate the same species or concepts? And I think uh, will the, the team it will choose um, one to to fit into that infographic is is what we were thinking of, Jack, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll just have to make that choice. And yeah, we but, but then what's, what, what's going to happen with a lot of those other ones is um, the um, imagine you are um, you're a, a, a we we we're going to be also looking for ways of using those other ones in other aspects of communication about mountain meadows. So. Um, as a um, as somebody's giving a presentation at um, at you know before a local um, community board, um, they're going to be also using these. So these these will have these these images that we're creating will have a life um, outside of this poster as educational infographics for this kind of communication. So some, something that we are also doing here is we're giving um, Point Blue our permission to use these as they see appropriate. Um, and we are going to be also keeping track of your names, the people who are submitting it. And so we are gonna be giving you a shout out and, and mad props. Um, but so a so number of these things will, um, so more than say one carbon picture may end up getting used in the sort of the overall kind of larger communication. Because sometimes what happens is people will say like, oh, I've seen that picture before. Um, and so they don't look at it again. But if you're giving a presentation and you put up a different image of carbon sequestration or stream bank incision, um, then they'll be like, oh, 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 that's cool. All right. Um, yeah, and what, what might work in the infographics, small, might be very different than if I want to show a big image of the whole carbon cycle thing going on. It may be a totally different image that works for that. And so I think, yeah, multiple for both would be, would really work great. And I, I would just emphasize, Jack, what you did with the Willow Flycatcher, like in, in these ecosystems, the linkages between, so if we're going to draw a pollinator, draw them with what they're pollinating. If you're going to draw a bird, draw where it's nesting. Those are really useful when we're trying to give more information really quickly uh, to yeah. people is those linkages, those ecological linkages between the species and the habitats or the, the ecological function and the habitat and stuff like that. So I would just urge you on in that direction to think about how to illustrate them in connection with their environment. Yeah, the word that Brian just used, connection, such an important um, concept for us as scientists. John Muir said when you tried to pick up out anything, one thing in the universe, you find it, it, it hitched to, to, to everything else. Um, and 
that's so true. So as you're doing this, we start thinking about those relationships. Willow flycatcher, there's the picture of the willow flycatcher. Now willow flycatcher nesting, I've got more of a sense. Willow flycatcher nesting in willow tree, all right? Um, there's more going on here. And so um, as you, the more you can web ideas together in your graphics, that's gonna be really, really cool. And um, I think this has the potential to be both fun, but let's see just also as, uh, here's, here's one last challenge for people. As you're doing this, as you're creating some um, uh, illustrations for this, I want to encourage everyone here to every once in a while, just sort of stop and remember that you are doing this for conservation of mountain meadows and that the work that you are doing is going to help protect and conserve mountain meadow systems. That it's, this is bigger than doing just a drawing. This is a drawing with a conservation mission to it. A a, you are now taking on the mantle of a science communicator. And the communication that you do is going to help people understand and appreciate and therefore protect these systems. I can't wait. I'm so excited about seeing what you're doing. Anne, back yeah, to you. Yeah, this is so exciting. And so along those lines, um, we're thinking that people can also be sharing their ideas on this in the Nature Journal Club on Facebook and other social media. And if they want to use the hashtag, how about hashtag restore mountain meadows? Oh, I like it. That sound good? Hashtag restore mountain meadows. So mountain meadows, plural? Yes. Because, mm -hmm. you know, we have 30,000 acres we want to tackle, right, Ryan? And um, the other thing is, if you'd like more information about all the work that Ryan's doing and his whole team and the, the whole collaboration, um, uh, please visit us at uh, Point Blue. And maybe, Lishka, if you could put in the uh, how to contact us and you know go to our website. But it's pointblue.org, basically. And um, so we'd love to have your involvement and answer your questions and keep you posted on this. And, and there I see it in the chat. Thank you, Lishka. Um, she's helped us put this together and helped us with communications. And uh, she's a great part of our Point Blue team. So go team. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and and also, yeah. can I, may I add, add one other thing I just thought of. Um, this is not a competition. Yeah. This is not a competition. Um, what I want to encourage you to do, instead of thinking of yourself against everybody else, and I hope mine gets picked and yours doesn't, is let's try to figure out a way that we together can make the best product for communicating this stuff that we can. So if you want to, like you're partway through something or you're kind of stumped on this, what if you posted it on the Nature Journal Club page with the hashtag and then said like, hey everybody, I want some feedback on this. Um, I'm having trouble kind of showing this. This is what I've got so far. How else could I take this? And then you see somebody else's stuff on there, give them the best feedback that you can to help them make this the best that they can, right? Um, so that it's, this is not a zero sum game. And the more that we collectively get the best visualizations we can for this mountain meadow system, the better. And back to you, Anne. Uh, yeah, so get involved, be part of the community, be part of the team. Um, we love all the collaboration here. And it is a collaboration. Um, it takes a lot of people working together and um, we just appreciate all the work that's being done all over the place. And like I say, this, this, these concepts apply not just to California meadows, but um, other mountain meadows around the world. So all of you out there, thanks for all the work that you're doing and all the support that you give us. All right, um, <clears throat> one last word. Um, 
Point Blue, awesome organization. Um, a lot of what they do, the funding comes through donations. If it's possible to make a donation to support uh, Point Blue Conservation Science, you can find that on their website, which has already been put up there, and I think we're about to put it in there again. Um, and um, mad props to you for the work that you are doing on behalf of, of nature, and that includes human beings. We are a part of nature. And um, we are, I gratefully res uh, appreciate and respect um, the way that you, uh, that you move in this world and the, the work that you do on behalf of all of our large expanded biological family. Thank you. All right. So this concludes our, our presentation. Um, for now, what we're about to do is just sort of drop into kind of um, chatty conversation time um, and our um, uh, the uh, sort of the, the community forum of this. Um, if if Ryan or Anne uh, need to, to 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 bounce at this point, we understand. But if it's possible for either of you to stick around, I'm, I think that there may be people who have specific questions for you or people who might want to um, share something. So if anybody's got some specific questions for uh, Ryan and Anne and the Point Blue team, maybe we start with that. Um, uh, the uh, and while that's going on, maybe we could put back into the chat just a reminder about when people when people want to submit uh, what that uh, the the URL to go to um, for that is. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I am now making it possible for people to unmute themselves. Bam! And I am jumping over to my gallery view to see if anybody has something that they wanted to share. If so, just wave at the screen, blow kisses, and um, or hold a page up to the screen that you'd like to share. And, um, uh, or you can use the raise hands function um, here in Zoom and um, we will see one of these things. Does anybody have something that they wanted to, either a question or something that they wanted to share? Oh, I see Susan here. Hey, Susan, it is really fun to see you again. I've missed you. Um, I'm going to start with Susan, then I'm going to, let's, let's start there. Um, add spotlight. So I'm going to turn down off everybody else's spotlight and um, tell us, oh, you can unmute yourself, I believe. And uh, see, so look at this, everybody. So the thinking has started here. The thinking has started. Well, I, I, I love animals, so I'll probably try to do a beaver and I'll make it have some babies because everyone adores baby animals and then might want to protect them. Oh, this but, is fun. Um, did you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, we did. Yeah. Okay, I couldn't tell. Okay, yeah, I, I love color too, so. Um, Oh, I, I, I think we are going to just end up with some really, really exciting visuals. I love the little fish swimming around there in the stream. Mm -hmm. um, I get a sense of, of depth in this, and I, and I, I can just visualize um, all the little moments starting to, to pop out with the spot illustrations, our little deer friends down there in the valley. Um, it's neat that just a few rocks down there and sort of the bedrock um, zone of that um, uh, of the of of that cutout um, are really helpful down there, aren't they? Can you repeat how to submit and in the? It seems like kind of yes. <laughs> um, so um, we've just put into the chat, and we'll also include that in the. Um, when we post this, this, uh, this workshop online, um, it's a link that will bring you to a Dropbox page. And the Dropbox page has um, all the resources that, it, it, it'll look like this. Um, when you go to the Dropbox, it will, um, bum, 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 bum. Okay. here I go. Um, so you're, I'm going to, 
Um, here, here I am, I'm in the Dropbox and it's got these, currently it has these four things in it. It has, number one is this Mountain Meadows infographic. And it says, and here's all the information about, um, you know, you, you're gonna go to this link here um, and you can add your graphic there. You can email it um, here. So all that information is going to be here. And we probably will be updating this. You know, for instance, I don't see on here, like we don't have like, you know, show us carbon sequestration, show us kind of the, the background sequestration. So we'll be adding a few more things on here that'd be kind of really kind of our wish list of stuff that we want. Yeah. Jack, I actually just added that stuff. So um, if you refresh, you'll get, um, oh, get all that stuff. Cool. I, yeah. I hope. We're <laughs> Let's going see there if now. it works. It's thinking. It's thinking. It's thinking. Now you guys get to see. Uh, oh, there it is. There. Look at all that. Stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, ideas. There you go. Oh, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we can keep updating that. So, and we'll we'll be updating this. So you can go there to that Dropbox, and in that Dropbox, you also are going to see this for inspiration. You know, mad props to the um, graphic illustrator, uh, the, the 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 graphic visualizer, the the visualizer, the person who did this. This is really really cool. I am in no way dissing this graphic, right? Um, but we're we, we're trying to see if we can get one that will tell even more of the story. There's also this cool um, uh, article here that you might want to read just to kind of give you more background about Mountain Meadows. And um, so these are slightly out of order. And, and then there's this one here. This is kind of a cool visual thing that they did here. Notice that the line between the ground and the cutaway, they've hit that with that dark line. That, that's an interesting kind of graphic choice. And I think it makes this graphic a little bit easier to read. Um, that's that's cool. Um, so that that's where I would go um, for all that information, Susan. Did that help? Mm -hmm. Great. And thank you. It, it's really good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> Take me off the big screen. Okay, off the big screen. Oh, hey. Um, now I'm going to jump back to my gallery view. Um, uh, Miriam, um, also, you know, you're somebody who's got crazy visualization chop, chops, all the stuff you've done with pyro sketchology um, is um, some, uh, if people want to be inspired about infographics, um, first tell us uh, what website people can go to to get to your resources on sort of thinking about fire and visualizing fire, because this is an incredibly inspiring site to go to for thinking about infographics. Thank you. Um, pyrosketchology.com is my website. Although um, I post uh, a lot of uh, my newer stuff on Facebook, um, some of the illustration work, that sort of thing. So, um, but I do need to kind of update my website as well. So both on Facebook and um, on pyrosketchology.com. And is so, that by Facebook, do you mean um, uh, go look for pyrosketchology on Facebook? Just or my name um, okay. on Facebook. And, and the pirate, so Pyro Sketchology is a website. I do have a Facebook page called Pyro Sketchology. And then I just have my personal account, which I post on the Nature Journal Club and that kind of stuff. Okay. Thank you. Um, so mine's kind of a question, but trying to tease out a concept of for something, an abiotic kind of process like the carbon sequestration, is there a particular plant or animal that maybe could? interface and overlay some of those things. So if you're talking about holding more moisture, maybe there's an amphibian and maybe some way to talk about and connect some of those more abstract things. So I'm just kind of curious if maybe there, you know, is a particular amphibian or plant with a certain kind of root system that could be identified so that, you know, people might be able to provide illustrations of those things, which might provide a more interesting thing than just a, here's a CO2, you know, and arrows, you might have something a little more um, concrete, interesting. So yeah. that's what I just wanted to throw out is the idea of can we come up with something that connects some of those abiotic things that are helpful, but not um, as visually exciting. But let me bring Ryan back in and see if, if he has any specific thoughts on that. 
um, for like, let's say we're showing the carbon thing or, or thinking about sponges and meadows or anything like that. Are there any particular species that would be really powerful tie-ins? Yeah, that's good. So the first thing that comes to my mind when you say that is, is we often in ecology study different species as indicators of the ecosystem health or function. Um, so you, you hit on it. So some of our frogs are very much associated with, um, with this wet sponge, but also water that's not associated with the stream channel because there's fish in the stream channel, some of them non-native nowadays. And so they need wetness year round away from that to stay away from them. So they're really good indicators of kind of that really wet sponge. Um, so not just wet soil, but standing water on the floodplain um, and, and little depressions and things like that. Um, so they're really good indicators of that. You know, in that sponge, what makes it a sponge is the carbon, right? That's it's the peat that's in the soils that does that, um, and so it's all tied together. So I love the idea of trying to tie these things together, or, or that idea of of this all kind of you know, it can cascade in a positive direction in a meadow, and it can cascade in a negative negative direction when you start pulling, as as uh, Jack was saying, you know, the hitch together stuff. You start pulling on one thread um, in the you unravel things in these meadows really fast. So um, willow flycatchers also are dependent. So it turns out our frogs, we went into some of these meadows, we found beavers in some of these places and the beavers were associating with all these endangered species. Um, and so we were finding willow flycatchers and sandhill cranes and the frogs all more abundant where the beavers were because the beavers were really creating that unique sponge wet condition um, so beavers, in a way, are, are maybe the keystone, as you described, but also maybe an indicator of this of the healthy wet meadow system. They're also keeping the meadow wetter that's helping sequester all the carbon. Um, so it made me think of like some sort of graphic where you're showing things cascade off of a certain species or functions in the meadow. But certainly the, um, you know, a healthy bird community, um, we, we don't just look at one species, we look at lots of species because they all use different parts of the meadow. So everything from their herbaceous vegetation on the ground, um, some of these flowers are so important. The calliope hummingbird, I'd love someone to draw a calliope, a calliope hummingbird, one of my favorite animals in the world. Um, smallest North American hummingbird, they nest in these meadows, they need flowers, they need nectar sources. Um, but you also need, if, you, if you're something like a red-breasted sapsucker, you need a dead tree to nest in, um, to put your nest in, or you need an aspen tree on the edge of the meadow to nest in. And so. There's so much within the diversity of habitats and structures and all that in a meadow exist all these different creatures. Um, and so we try to monitor as many of them as we can, but picking some out as kind of indicators to suggest a really healthy meadow has a diversity of all these creatures in it. And that's probably a pretty good indication that it's a resilient system and a healthy system. Um, and so that's, that's the way I think to think about it. It's not just the endangered animal that's important in here. It's often these more common things they're indicating for some function, um, process or, or structure that exists in the system. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, now I am going to, uh, to, to, I'm going to bounce over to Aisha. Uh, oh, sorry, Aisha. Um, to Aisha for, um, another question, here I go, one moment. And um, Aisha, uh, good to have you with us. Yep, thank you. Uh, I just had some really specific questions for Ryan or Anne uh, about species. Please. As I think about, I was wondering, um, do the willow flycatchers, I know they're general insect eaters um, in these meadows, would it be, uh, mayflies be among their um, food sources, swarms of mayflies? Yeah, absolutely. So they are often associated with aquatic insects. And so if you've ever spent time in a meadow, <laughs> it could be mosquitoes, but it could it's also be- It's a lot be, of mosquitoes. It could be other species, um, certainly any of the aquatics that are coming up off of the water. So like caddisflies, stoneflies, all that? Absolutely, and in fact, those, those um, we call them aquatic macroinvertebrates, yep. are often uh, are used as indicators of water quality in California and especially in our mountain meadows. And so there, that's something cool to think about too, some stones that have 
you know, stonefly larva on it or something like that. Yeah, and like I was thinking or, maybe yeah. of trying to illustrate some of the big swarms that one sees and just that incredible insect life that one senses walking through a meadow or sees through the light. Just because I was nature journaling that myself recently at a lake and all the swarms and trying yeah. to catch the light through them. And I was like, well, the food chain, you know, how can I um, illustrate some of the food chains happening? Love it. Uh, yeah. Everything yeah. connected. Okay. That's what's, that's what's driving species, you know, wildlife species in these meadows is food and the insects is where it starts in these meadows for sure. Tons of insects. Totally. So I was thinking maybe you're going to get into, into insects. Also, when you mentioned the calliope hummingbird, what would you say? There's a couple of us uh, botany lovers here. What would you say would be the most likely flower species they're nectaring on? Yeah, they're nectaring on. It's a variety, but, you know, something that, uh, you know, it's interesting that the hummingbirds tend to be picky about their flowers. They try to go to things that the bees don't go to all the time. They, I don't yeah. think they like to fight the bees. Um, but Did you, know, you say you know, like I'll, shooting stars? Shooting stars for sure. Um, cool. But, you know, I actually see them in some of the castileas. So the paintbrush okay. species, um, that we have a beautiful paintbrush in the Lassen area called uh, Lassen paintbrush, which is a newly identified species uh, separated out from a more common one. A okay. really hot pink color to it. Um, a deep magenta almost. Um, but uh, columbine is another one we see. The leopard lilies, I mean, that's the beauty of meadows. We have such charismatic flowers in the, our meadows that it would be great to see some of those um, in associating with you know bees and wildlife and other things like that. So there's a diversity that they use, will use. Um, it's interesting, hummingbirds are actually insect eaters too. So you'll see them in swarms of mayflies picking off little mayflies too. So, um, but yeah, there's, a number of those kind of fritillaries, um, yeah, that occur in the meadows. They're, they're using a lot of different species, uh, but usually occurring in these meadows that have a diversity of flowering plants that are, you know, tend to be tubular kind of flowers. Uh, yeah, okay. think of, of things, especially things that are red and things that have tubes. Well, um, I was just trying, wanting to find out what were the, some of the specific yeah. species that, you know, really are, that the calliope is using in our mountain meadows, so I don't just start going off somewhere else. Yeah, I, I, I might not use the, I, I think of the uh, shooting star as more of a, a bee pollinated one. Okay. Um, they do buzz pollination hanging on the- Oh, that's um, true. The, they are buzz. Never mind. Right. I've done the whole tuning fork thing on it. Oh, <laughs> you rock. Of course you have. <laughs> of course I have. Um, and okay. so um, are, are you seeing um, crimson columbine up in your meadows there, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. Thank um, you. Yeah, about, I was trying to get very specific with species. Um, and what about uh, scarlet gilia? Yeah, it grows on the on the margins, the wet edge. But yeah, the hummingbirds go crazy for that plant for sure. Um, yeah, and these these hummingbirds, you know, the edges of the meadows are get used. Another one that's on the edge of our meadows, that you'll see them using early in the year, is a, a shrub. It's called Ribes nevadaensa. It's Sierra current. It has these little pink flowers that pedestals that dangle down and the hummingbirds are all over those. Um, oh yeah, yeah, right, okay. And perhaps some California fuchsia, the epilogue. And perhaps some willow fluff for their seeds, for their um, nests yeah, from the catkins. Yeah, and, and so yeah, on, on these, if you, if you really kind of want to get, um, so notice that um, Aisha, everybody, notice that Aisha is getting really specific here. So she's saying, I want to draw a hummingbird at a flower, but um, knowing how things are connected out there in nature, um, she's not just saying, I'm so I'm going to jack in this daisy next to it. Like here it is next to the daisy. Because it turns out that the hummingbirds don't go to the daisies. So there, there's specific sorts of things. So um, like if you are drawing a humming, say a hummingbird at its nest, is get some real research material on what that hummingbird's nest looked like. What does the willow flycatcher's nest look like? What are they, 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 they stuffed with? Because if you put a willow flycatcher on a robin nest, most people won't know it. But the ones who do notice it are the ones who, you know, you really want to make proud of you. <laughs> and, and so um, it's a great place just to put in a little bit more kind of research like all right so I'm gonna put this not just not in on a nest but its nest what does it nest in like you know what is that the the fuss? so that would be some kind of fun things to well do you have any other those are so you you know um, I just also thinking like a scientific illustrator here 
wanting to really kind of dial in on specifically um, what's, what's, what's going on with that. Um, did you have any other questions? Nope, thank you. Those were the burning ones. Great. Hey, it's really good to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump over to the gallery again. Um, is there anybody else who has a um, question for Ryan or Anne? Um, here, Chris, good to see you. Um, I am going to bring you in. Hey there, Chris, good to see you. Hi. Um, which plants are the ones that are on the negative side and which ones are on the positive sides? I know um, like rushes maybe use an awful lot of water up, they hold the soil. Are, are they, um, which ones do you think are the ones that should stand out and be illustrated this way? Yeah, I'd say most of them have their place in the meadow um, in their niche in the meadow. And so a lot of times some of these species that are now in the middle of our meadows should have been occurring on the edges. And so they've encroached all the way in. Um, I would say your healthy one should not have a bunch of sagebrush in it and it should not have a bunch of lodgepole pine growing throughout the middle of the mm -hmm. meadow. That's a degraded drying out meadow. Um, so you definitely, so we just talked a lot about the, the forbs that are, you know, providing a lot of nectar and other resources, but oftentimes right. in the wettest part of the meadows, those species aren't growing. They're do it's dominated by sedges and rushes, which are rhizominous. So they produce <laughs> shoots under the ground and they can dominate. If the conditions are just right, right, nice and wet, they will dominate and nothing else can grow with them very well. They'll take over and they are a carbon factory, so it's good. But then as you move away from the center of the meadow, so I think that's another important place to get here is that not all things occur in the same place in a meadow. They have their own unique places where it's near the edge, a little high spot, um, you know, just into the forest a little bit or right on the channel or in the water, like all those different things support different elements of a, of a meadow community. They're all important. Um, when we dry them out, we just turn the whole thing into kind of the same thing and it's a big upland sagebrush flat or, you know, turns back into a forest really fast. Um, so yeah, I think Think about it that way, like uh, where do they occur? But uh, certainly all of these species, meadow species are important as well as the kind of uh, music to them. We have this concept in plants of wetland obligate and then facultative wetland. And so the wetland obligate, it only grows if it's in saturated soil for a long part of the year. And some of these other ones just want it a little wetter than the uplands. And so both occur in our meadows, they tend to occur in the edges versus the middle. I think I'm more confused now than I was before, but it, it is the relationship and the dispersal uh, is more important than the actual uh, species. Or, or, or maybe or, I, 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 I might be able to, um, to put it a, a, a different way. I think he's saying that, um, you know, the, rather than saying like, here's, here's my good species, here's my bad species, um, like they've all kind of, you know, um, they've all kind of got their place in the choir there. And some sing lower and some sing higher, right? And so the, um, some you will find uh, in, in a healthy meadow closer to the middle of the meadow, um, others towards the edge of the meadow. When we get a meadow that's dried out, you find things like the sagebrush encroaching in and lodgepole pine trees growing in on that dry mm -hmm. space. Um, but then when you return it to the wet conditions, those can't survive anymore. And they're replaced then by these, 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 these plants that are mm -hmm. um, going. So, you know, for instance, in your, um, in your garden, if you're thinking about like, I want to get drought tolerant plants, so I'm not gonna put in these rushes because they're gonna use up so much water. That's not really a problem up there in the mountain meadow ecosystem um, with them using too much water. It is, um, they're, they're, they're really good at, at, at stabilizing the banks of the creeks. They're great at carbon sequestration. Um, and there's um, plenty enough water for them to be able to survive and do their thing and just be like little monsters there by the side of the creek, just gobbling mm -hmm. up carbon and pecking it down in the soil. Um, so sometimes, so it's not so much an, an issue of how much water they use and that being kind of a good thing or a bad thing because we're not really having to worry about the water meter on them. Um, they're not gonna you know, drink, transpire so much that it's gonna suck up the stream or something like that. Mm -hmm. Did that address your question? 
Yeah, a little bit. And some of them just hold the soil from eroding, right? That's okay. Yeah, it's all related. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's just, it's just something that's fun about this is that kind of, kind of coming down this rabbit hole, you are going to end up just geeking out on some things that you didn't wouldn't think you'd be geeking out on. And, you know, like getting yourself like, like, so as I'm drawing this meadow, and there are different plants, oh, by the way, Ryan, uh, and Anne, if somebody, while they're doing this, they've got a specific question about mountain ecosystems, where should they send an email to? That's a good one. That's a good question. Um, I'm happy to answer them. I don't know if it's that info, maybe Lish can help us on that, if she's still there, the info um, at Point Blue, but we'll we'll get that back and put that in that document. And so, yeah, absolutely can reach out and happy to, I love uh, teaching about mountain meadows and inspiring people about that. So I'm happy to answer your questions um, as they come up. And, and, and as you answer those questions, it means that the infographic you'll be getting will be that much richer. Mm -hmm. And you won't be sitting there thinking like, I wish you had the darker ones closer to the river instead of the other way around, if you only you'd call mm -hmm. me, right? Um, but. I'll put something in the chat in just a minute. Um, I think Lishka has had to go to another meeting. So I will dig around and see where we should send questions. But, yeah. Thank you, Anne. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right. Uh, we are about to be closing our meeting, and I'm just going to bounce over to the gallery one more time. If there is a question that you have for our guests, um, um, this is a great time to do that. Um, I also want to just send a shout out to uh, Ivea Moore and Melinda Nakagawa. So grateful to you folks for behind the scenes um, helping um, wrangle the back room of, uh, turns out that running a Zoom meeting, it really, really helps to have a team in the background kind of making everything run smoothly and uh, really appreciate that. I also want to um, give, send out my um, respect and thanks again to um, um, Anne, Ryan, and the whole team at Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, you know, we are not alone in taking care of this beautiful planet. The more that we kind of come together in stewardship, in fellowship, we make a difference together. And um, that just the, the, the beauty of the hearts that kind of come together to do this sort of work is another thing that just really gives me hope, really gives me hope for, um, for our, 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 our future together. All right, my friends, um, we are going to um, bring this to a close. So appreciative of you being here and really looking forward to the uh, flood of creativity that I know that's gonna come out of um, all of your efforts. Thank you so much. Oh, I, before we go, I see uh, Ray Bontos uh, got something that he wanted to, to share, a thought for everybody. Um, I'm going to, you are live, Ray Bonto, good to see you. Um, hi, can you share pages today? Um, let's do one share and just sort of do one share with us and then we'll, we'll, we'll bring it up. I think that because it's usually, it's, I advertise it as a one hour thing and we're now two hours into it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but um, I'm, it, it'll be, I would really love to see um, what is inspiring you and what is happening in your, your notebook. And if you could share that with us before we, uh, before we, we wrap today. Ah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Great visualization. Great visualization. You know, just, um, it, the the colors really you know help it's it's clear it's it's easy to understand what's going here and i love those those gentle meanders of the stream uh, back and forth there thank you thank you hey thank you it's really good to see you um have you seen any uh cool uh made any neat nature observations recently yes maybe you share one of those with us too if you would Okay. 
Um, I was catching my dead insects. <sighs> <laughs> this is exciting. Hold that a little bit closer to the screen. We'd love to take a look at these. Oh, yes. Oh, and you're even getting into the venation on the wings. Um, all of my entomologist friends would love to see that. Because um, you know, each, um, what's going on on the wings of different bees, it's, they've got different vein patterns on each one, on different species. Um, so, um, here's the bee. Uh, <laughs> yes, yep. No, just it's 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 neat. You know, like somebody who's not a nature journaler um, would not see all the sort of the beauty in these sorts of things. You can just get so much out of these sorts of observations. What is that? Um, that's see. that's a fly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And the wing. Where's the wing? Um, the small. Here's the bee wing. Oh. Uh... <laughs> that is great. Thank yeah, um, it's, it's, it's neat. When you look in um, keys to different types of, of um, insects and things, sometimes they're looking at, um, they'll have diagrams and charts of the wings of these different insects. And you're trying to figure out which species it is based on whether the wing branches here or here, or if it then goes over here and then makes a Y or this vein dead ends or it connects into this other vein. Um, so looking at those sorts of details, um, that's, uh, that's some great entomology that you're up to there. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. That's a fantastic way to end our show, everybody. Just remember that you can find um, its uh, fascination, wonder, beauty, and intrigue anywhere you look. It's not, it's not where you look, it's how you look. Mm -hmm. And um, this, uh, those, those bees is a great example of that. Um, Ray Bonto, I'm gonna bring you up on the screen uh, just so together the two of us are going to kind of wave everybody out. Um, there we go. Um, so um, from all of us to you, you can do this and see what happens when, um, uh, you know, just let yourself kind of go down the rabbit hole, perhaps with the, the bees on the windowsill, perhaps with uh, the wonders of a mountain meadow. And we're really appreciative of all of you for being with us today. Again, uh, the team at Point Blue, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.